Hello everyone, we're going to continue with chapter 7 in lecture 2 and in this lecture we're going to begin to give you an overview of the solo growth model. So I want to give you a picture of the whole model and all the pieces and then I want to create, paint for you one piece and that's the production function. Okay, so solo model is due to Robert Solo. Um, uh, major paradigms widely used in policy making it's a benchmark against most recent um, theories are compared essentially if you can't do at least as good as the solo model did then don't bother uh, and it looks at determinants of economic growth and the standard of living in the long run now this is important to remember this is definitely a very long run model so what's some differences from what we've done so far First of all, K is not fixed. All right. One of the things that we're going to do within this uh, model is figure out how K is determined. And we'll note that when we invest, when we buy capital, we increase capital. And when it depreciates or we use it up, capital shrinks. So we're going to have two different flows for capital. We're going to have this increase in capital by buying new capital. And we're going to have the decrease in capital through that capital's wearing out. So, for example, if I buy a factory, I build a factory, I have machines in that factory, but they don't last forever. They do wear out over time, and we deal with that through depreciation. L is no longer fixed. The population um, can grow. So we're going to have um, population or labor force which grows over time. We're going to simplify the consumption function even more. And we're going to ignore both uh, government, uh, government spending, and taxes. So we're going to have a gov basically we're going to have a closed economy with no government spending and no taxes. So well, we basically our um, GDP is going to equal y will equal what c plus i. There's no g and no net exports. So the basic building blocks. Here are the pieces that we'll need to do. The first one is the production function. All right. Remember, we've talked about production functions before. What that does is going to map our inputs, our capital and our labor, into how much we can produce. So it's going to tell us what the maximum amount we can produce with that amount of capital and that amount of labor is consumption function that's going to tell us given our income how much we want to consume so if we make y units of output how many of those units do we want to consume how many of those units do we want to put towards buying capital savings and investment function so we're going to create a savings function that'll tell us how much we're going to save or in this case, since in, we're in equilibrium, savings equals investment, and this is the long run, so we're basically going to be assuming equilibrium, short-run equilibrium, we, um, not to be confused with steady state, we'll get there. Um, we're going to assume savings equals investment, and, well, given a certain amount of income, how much do we invest? How much do we save? All right. Finally, we're going to figure out something called break-even investment. Okay, and that function is going to evolve throughout the chapter, throughout the chapter eight and throughout chapter nine. So I'm initially we call it the depreciation function in the textbook. I'm going to skip right over that step and call it break-even investment. What break-even investment is is it tells me the minimum amount of investment I need to keep capital constant. All right, and I'll go a little bit f farther into that because I didn't say it exactly right. Actually, it's capital per worker we're keeping constant and really is capital per effective worker that we're keeping constant, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So um, that's an idea of what that's going to be. Then we're going to have a law of motion. What a law of motion does is it's simply an equation that governs the movement of a system. Okay, so that doesn't make much sense right now, I know, but don't worry. It will when we get to it. And then finally, we're going to talk about steady state. And remember, steady state is kind of this idea of equilibrium kind of, um, in the context of a dynamic model. So that is the um, basic ideas that we're going to go through. So it's the overview of the model. 
So the first thing I want to talk about now is the production function. So let's talk about the production function. Our production function is going to be pretty basic. It's simply, um, we're going to use a Cobb-Douglas production function. It's going to be y equals some function of capital and labor. Now we're going to make some assumptions about this function. The first one is it's going to be Cobb-Douglas. So we're going to use the same function we defined way back in, whenever it was that we defined that and which chapter that was. Um, but the next thing we're going to do is we're going to assume that it has constant returns to scale. CRTS, constant returns to scale. Remember, why did we assume constant returns to scale? Well, first of all, it's going to make it easier. But secondly, it's also, it's very hard to reject constant returns to scale if we look at macro data empirically. Uh, but fundamentally, for our purposes, it makes the math much, much easier. And you really don't gain a lot of insight into the model um, by relaxing constant returns to scale. It just makes it more complicated. So for right now, let's walk before we run, and we're going to assume constant returns to scale. So let me keep going here, and let's figure out, well, what does that bias? So first of all, y is what? Y is total output. All right, that's you could think of that as real GDP, equals a function And I'm going to write this a little weird, capital and labor. But if it's constant returns to scale, what would happen if I say, I don't know, multiplied capital by 1 over L and multiplied L by 1 over L? All right. In other words, I divided my capital by labor and my labor by labor. What would happen? Well, I'd end up with this. So I'm going to write this in here. 1 over L. All right, that's the same thing as dividing by L. And 1 over L. But if I do that and I have constant returns to scale, what do I have to do here? Well, I have to multiply this by 1 over L. Okay, so let's go ahead and define some new notation. First of all, I want to define output per worker little y equals big Y, which is output, divided by labor, or output per worker. Let's also define little k, excuse me, little k. That equals capital divided by labor, or that's capital per worker. Okay, so we have output per worker and capital per worker. Now I could define little l, which would be worker per worker, but that just equals one, so we'll skip that. All right, and so let me go ahead, I could rewrite this as y, little y, output per worker equals what? I'm going to call this big F of little k, right? And, well, one, because L over L is just 1, right? And well, I could rewrite this in a different sense because 1 always stays constant, right? L divided by L, the ratio of labor to labor is always going to be 1 because it's the same variable on top as the bottom. So I could rewrite this like this. I'm going to use a little f of little k. Little f of little k is the per worker production function. Now we're going to come back to this over and over again. But this is our basic production function. Now let me write this down again. All right. Little y, which equals what? Output per worker equals little f of little k. Little k is what? That's capital per worker. And little f of little k is the per worker production function. So here's the thing. In economic growth, oftentimes we want to compare across countries. We want to look at um, sometimes big countries, sometimes little countries. Well, who should have a bigger GDP? The United States or Iceland? Well, the United States. Why? Because the United States has more people. We have more mouths to feed. We better have more income, right? Um, uh, well, here's another one, more challenging one. Who should have, not who does have, but who should have a bigger GDP? The United States or China? Well, guess what? 
China should have a bigger GDP than the United States. Why? Because they've got like three times as many people. So they have three times as many mouths to feed, which means they really ought to have more income than we do, right? but not necessarily on a per capita or per worker basis, right? So we want to adjust for the size of the economy. Now note, I'm not saying China has a bigger GDP than we do. They don't. We have a larger GDP still. They may overtake us um, somewhat soon, but I would argue that that's not as big a deal as we might think. What we want to focus on, though, is per worker or per capita GDP, okay? In this case, where our model works with per worker GDP but if you think about the labor force and the population being somewhat correlated over time uh, then you can kinda think of the two concepts somewhat interchangeably although not perfectly All right, per worker adjusts for the size of the economy or the size of the of people inside the economy so the size of the nation and we want to keep and compare apples to apples so we look at China which you have heard many stories about they're going to overtake us in GDP fairly soon well that's true but their per capita GDP is less than one-fourth of our per capita GDP so if we adjust for population size, we're still massively bigger. Okay, So that's why we're going to focus in on per capita workers, or, or I'm sorry, um, output per worker, and then the production function per worker, and capital per worker. One side note, sometimes this little k will get referred to by con economists as the capital labor ratio. Okay, so sometimes we'll call it the capital labor ratio. So let's take a look at this. We have our production function. It looks like little f of little k. We see this. It's a very standard um, increasing concave function. I know you don't care about those um, math terms, but essentially what does it mean? That means the marginal product of capital is diminishing as capital increases. So we have diminishing marginal product of capital per worker. And this really should be MP little k because that's the marginal product of capital per worker. Right? Notice that we exhibit diminishing marginal product of capital per worker. Alright, that was our first piece. Now we'll go on to the next lecture. We'll make more pieces.